So welcome to today's session. This is Jyoti Dodia, and this is the 84th session in the PowerVug technical webinar series. I'm really pleased to have Petra Buer and David Spurway deliver this session for us today. And it's all about AIX, how to unleash the power of AIX and how to win with AIX in the era of cloud containers and AI. And this is based on some feedback that I received um, from subscribers asking for such sessions. So uh, without further ado, let me hand over control to Petra and um, then um, let Petra kick off the session. Oh, David, you've got control. Could you pass it on to Petra, please? Yes, let me see if I can do that. I thought I'd stopped, but... Uh, uh... Just the right click on my name, change role to presenter. Right click on you, okay. Uh... <laughs> so all, all that testing is about again? Right. Um... <laughs> I'm failing. I'm failing. Let's see. Uh, uh, do you see the participant pane? It, it's okay, it's... David. I'm I'm going to change it to me mm. and then okay. hand you over. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Okay. There you go, Petra. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can, every, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. All right. So I guess you introduced the topic and just one more sentence from my end. Uh, we have seen a lot of requests in terms of AX topics uh, in various areas. So we will touch on AX strategy and roadmap, um, kind of the support metrics. We will talk about recent enhancements of AX itself, but as well throughout the ecosystem, which is power system software in the first place and then talk as well about AX modernization topics such as cloud containers and AI. And of course, as well, cover um, some TCO studies that they would will talk about and how really running AX on uh, in a private cloud can be yeah, much more attractive than uh, other public cloud deployments. So we put our details here. Um, for those of you who, who don't know me, I'm part of the worldwide offering management team within Power or in Cognitive Systems these days. And uh, one area of my responsibility is AX, which means the base AX, but as well AX capabilities throughout the Power System software stack. And basically the other area of my responsibility is security. David, do you want to introduce yourself now or later, or probably everyone knows you? No, I don't think everyone on this call will know me. So, hello, I'm, I'm David Sparaway. I'm the CTO for UK, uh, UK and Ireland uh, for Power Systems. I, I run around normally the UK and Ireland, but occasionally a wider field, talking at reasonably high speed about all things to do with Power Systems, uh, be that AIX, RBMI, AI, or anything in between. Uh, but uh, as this is a worldwide call, I'll be trying to slow down, but it's not my natural form. So we'll see what we can manage as we go forward. Back to you, Petra. Sounds good. All right, let's get started. This uh, so I, I touched on strategy, recent enhancements, modernization, and these type of things. So let's get started um, with the AX strategy. And on this slide here, you can see a lot of things that AX is known for a long time on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, you can see right new type of areas we are bridging to since a while. And of course, by doing so, we help clients to to protect their investment. So when we talk about AX strategy, I put here the AX strategic themes uh, from my perspective, right? First of all, provide a high value platform for mission critical workloads and further improve um, uh, AX's core capabilities around performance, scale, availability, security, and such. But at the same time, deliver innovations alongside. So since a while, we are exploiting open technologies. And you can see a couple of items on the right, right? I mean, Power VC, our tool for private cloud management is built on OpenStack and thus highly interoperable with higher level cloud orchestrators. We contribute to several communities uh, in terms of cloud automation uh, with, um, with uh, tools like Chef, Ansible, or Puppet. We spend quite some work and effort on enabling more flexible infrastructure choices. And what that means is uh, cloud, of course, um, as well. Uh, so I put here IBM Cloud Power VC Manager, which we, for instance, integrated with Spectrum Scale that allows for 
um, uh, for sandless clouds um, and Power VC with, with local disk, so to speak. Um, we can bridge to IBM Cloud Private and we will talk um, on, on, on the details on all of these later in this deck. We enable selected um, AX workloads to run on the hyperconverged infrastructure pi powered by Nutanix. And we as well have AX available in the public cloud since a while collaborating with SkyTab, uh, but announced uh, a couple of weeks back as well in the IBM cloud. Last but not least is AX Cognitive. So one thing that works since quite a while, I think uh, one and a half or even two years, is that AX clients can connect their Oracle or DB2 and AX databases to the Watson data platform to analyze that data further and leverage cognitive capabilities. And what we will see later in this deck that we are looking at additional capabilities because uh, several clients right, have concerns doing so and would prefer an on-prem um, flavor of this. Um, this is the AX release roadmap, and I'm asked quite a bit, um, well, how does the AX release roadmap look like? And in particular, what about an AX next, right, the first row here? Uh, and sometimes I get emails such as, well, AX is fading, AX is going away because there's no plan for an AX next, or we did not put out an AX next. Uh, so my response and my view on this really is that um, it's a major strength we have with AAX that we can deliver major capabilities uh, via technology levels. Um, so there's no, no need for massive kernel change, no need for applications to recompile. And for those of you who are, who are around since a while, um, I mean, that as well would mean um, ISV um, application would need to um, recertify, which takes quite a while, and we are still working on getting ISV certification for 7.1 that we use uh, for 7.2 that we use staff with 7.1 because it's just effort and time. So the only reason why we should out put out an AX8 or something like this is due to marketing or to satisfy analysts. But if we talk to our clients and the technical people, they do not want this. They prefer getting major functionality via ongoing technology levels on, on 7.2. Um, I just um, uh, updated the AX strategy paper, or it's uh, better said, um, I think, rewritten. Uh, we're just going to find the reviews, and that should be available shortly. So within there, we will have the roadmap, our release strategy, the support metrics, uh, and, and such. So. Uh, when, whenever this is uh, published, maybe the OTI, I, I get you the link and you can uh, distribute this to your community. Of course, thanks. Another question that pops up very often, what about AX now that we um, acquired Red Hat? And I mean, I think uh, all of you or a lot of you know Nigel and he brought some of these to my, um, uh, to my attention. So I put here three extremes from social media. Um, stating, well, so IBM finally admits AX is dead. Uh, now we have IBM's bid to kill off Linux by making it proprietary. Or, yeah, IBM will clearly merge AX and Red Hat and make a mess of both. Um, so my two cents on that, um, our message always was and will be pick and choose. And, I mean, we have three operating systems running on power, um, AX, IBM I, and Linux. Uh, AX and IBM I were developed in-house versus we partnered with the various distros. Now we can offer the complete portfolio um, from within IEM, which allows for more flexible licensing scenarios for our clients, and I will touch on that later a bit. Plus, I mean, Red Hat is not just another OS. Um, Red Hat really evolved from an open source pioneer to driving force in hybrid cloud computing as IB and as IBM pushes the whole multi-cloud and hybrid cloud story quite a bit, right? And we have capabilities there. This is just a a good add to what we have in place for a better overarching hybrid cloud story. And in terms of the last one, I mean, uh, I, I don't think the merge is, is going to happen, and I have no idea how, how one would do that. And that would take hundreds of years, uh, if you ask me, uh, in particular from a, from a legal standpoint. So I can't see this happening in, in our lifetime. A support metrics, I get quite a bit of question on, hey, what about 5.3 on Power9 and these type of things? So on this slide, you can see 5.3 was not 
enabled to run on Power9 at all. Um, you can see that basically whenever we come up with a new hardware generation, we usually support just the latest, greatest, or N-1 um, to run natively on that new generation. But of course, the other one, ones are supported in uh, compatibility mode, so to speak. So a couple of points I wanted to make here is that new innovations are really only put in our most current release stream, which is AX7.2. Um, 7.1 is, of course, still in support, but the last TL shipped uh, in fall 2017. 6.1 is already in its extended support period, which means there's an extra fee associated with uh, getting support for that one if you would like to do so, and that's confirmed until April 2020. We will um, probably give clients on Power 8 and 9 a little bit of extra time. As we know, it's hard to upgrade hardware and software all together. 5.3 will finally have its life in April 2019, so next month. So there's no possibility to run 5.3 supported beyond that date. Uh, and with supported, I mean full support, right? I mean, some GEOS um, TSS offers usage and non-defect um, only through year end but that does not incorporate new fixes, no security fixes on all that. So for all of you still running on 5.3, it's, it's really time to move to supported versions, um, both from a capability, but as well from a security standpoint. And 2019 is as well the end of service year for quite a few hardware generations um, for Power 5, 6, and 7. And of course, it's always good to have an overall supported stack versus running supported AX versions on unsupported hardware, for instance. We did quite a bit in order to enable smooth migrations from, to Power 9 from Power 7 and 8. So for instance, Power VM Enterprise Edition was put in every Power VM based server. And there is a 60-day activation feature, um, a free 60-day activation feature for clients that might have just PowerVM Standard Edition on Power 7 and 8 uh, in case they would leverage LPM um, to move their workloads to Power 9. And in AX in, uh, in particular, right? So basically, you can take any AX workload running on Power 7 or 8 today um, without interruption and, and move it up to Power 9. Uh, via LPM. Here is an overview of recent AX enhancements, and on this slide is basically all the enhancements we made available in second half last year. That means, I mean, we had a lot of um, Power9 enablement support packages um, aligned with the staged hardware GA, and then of course the 7.2 TL3 um, as well. So we did a whole lot around new levels of workload scalability. So for instance, we changed the SMT default mode to SMT8 uh, for Power9 to provide the best out of the box uh, performance experience. Uh, we allow for quite a few threads in a single VM as well as up to 32 terabyte, uh, which is uh, quite a bit. We enabled the dynamic systems optimizer and there's a whole new instruction set that can be leveraged by Java or other applications to push, boost performance even further. Then we did quite a bit in terms of security, um, and I will touch on that in a bit, but with a scale out boxes early last year, we introduced firmware trusted in secure boot, which means we sign, we digitally sign our firmware images and when clients boot the firmware up, they can verify that this is the uh, firmware provided by IBM and it has not been tampered with. And now with this TL, we build that up into AX as well. So they are digitally signed OS images, um, plus uh, a couple of more security features. Then further enhancements to AX Live update, which we initially uh, just provided to uh, apply iFixes without having to reboot. Um, subsequently enabled SPs and TLs last year. we. Uh, or 2017, uh, during fall, we enabled and integrated with PowerVC so that PowerVC can manage the live update and do some further simplification. And now with this TL, we integrated with LPM because several or a lot of times clients don't have the resources on the same frame available to do to create that surrogate LPA on. So now they can basically LPM the workload somewhere else where they have space uh, do the live update 
uh, date and, and LPM back. And we have as well, in case live update is not an option, a feature to basically reduce the CPU needed um, until the live update successfully completed and then uh, release it back to normal. Um, one thing we did as well, and this is a firmware improvement, but AX benefits heavily from that as well, that um, we provide encrypted and compressed LPM data, which well, tremendously speeds them up, but of course it's more secure as data and flight is encrypted. I will have a slide on that in a bit. Then we have uh, new I.O. features such as the latest graduates PCI Gen 4 or uh, support for NVMe. We had enhancements to our multipath um, I.O. infrastructure and a couple of more enhancements. If you are interested in the very details, the RFA link you can see at the bottom. And then not related or not tied to SPs or TLs where a lot of AX toolbox updates um, that we made available. And I will touch on that later in a little bit more detail. Um, this is slide on that uh, compressed and encrypted LPM data. So far, that's only available in the firmware 920 that we delivered with the high-end servers. And as you can see, th this provides quite some improvements. Not so much, or well, yeah, it, it's good as well. On the left-hand side, if you just do single LPMs, no matter if idle or under stress. But if you look at the right, this really gets very beneficial when doing a lot of concurrent LPMs. Um, and we are actually working on making this available in our um, scale out um, service as well um, later this year. And I think that's quite a benefit because, I mean, clients do LPM more and more because more and more clients really run their environment as a true private cloud and move stuff around. Um, in terms of cloud, um, I mean, um, subscription models um, come around the corner, right? I mean, we always had the AX Perpetual model. We came um, out with an AX Monthly option in spring 2017, so almost two years ago. One, one pain point was that the adoption was not um, as, as, as good as we thought because that offering was made available through Passport Advantage, which is a different ordering system. And our client sales and business partners are really used to AAS eConfig. So what I did last fall is uh, we came to a kind of compromise and we create, um, created packages of AX monthly available through AAS eConfig so they can just be purchased with the box um, um, or uh, via the usual way, so to speak. So in the case a client would like to do a POC, they can just purchase a three-month pack that includes then license and swarmer and after the three months can just decide to get another pack or purchase the perpetual one. And this is of interest for MSPs and CSPs or uh, smaller clients as well, because I mean, a lot of times we hear the initial investment in AX is high. So this allows basically to um, distribute the investment in AX more over the usage period. Another thing that plays into the same area is capacity on demand, which we had uh, around since a while. But what we did last year is we um, made a feature available in EES, ESS, econ, uh, in ESS and Marketplace so that clients can actually purchase that additional capacity in a self-service way um, through, through these sites. Um, so Clients could go there, purchase processor days or memory activations, um, and really deploy it within five to ten minutes, which is quite different to how it previously worked, where you still had to place an order, some back and forth, so it was not so much on demand as uh, one would think. Next one is power system software offerings. Sorry, Petra, yep. can I interrupt you briefly? Sure. Um, the, there's a couple of questions popped up. Um, is a modern browser running in AIX in plan or in the new toolbox? Not at the moment, but I'm happy to set out a follow up on that one. We had a couple of clients call, so if uh, whoever asked that question uh, um, uh, would be willing to reach out to me, um, that would be good to, to, have, to have a discussion on that. Okay. Um, 
I, Ivan, if you could um, just send an email, that would be great. Um, and I also um, just asked what kind of version release um, people are running in their production partitions, just to get a nice idea. And we've got a few um, few responses to that in the chat window. So quite a lot, seven ones and seven twos, um, some sort of six one. Um, and then a couple of uh, questions that have come up uh, about specific adapter so is the 100 gig adapter supported on AIX as a dedicated adapter or can it be virtualized through the iOS well, we can find out the answer to that if you don't know top of your head yeah I don't know top of my head I guess I have a couple of material on what adapters are supported um, I will pull that all here again it would be good to to receive mm -hmm. it as well okay um, yeah but and e um, Capacity on demand via ECS, ESS, sorry, elect, mm -hmm. uh, ESS. Are there plans to have this available for Germany? Is is a question. So. I think Europe is enabled already. Um, I can, I can. If that one sends me an email, I have a whole deck on that or a couple of slides on the detail. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it was just in general a stage rollout via geographies because they used different billing systems that all needed to um, integrate it as back end in the ESS. Uh, that was the only reason, um, to my knowledge, um, Europe is or, um, enabled or uh, a lot of countries within Europe are enabled already. Let me check on that and, and get back. Okay, that's fine. I'll put post uh, your email ID in the chat window. Yep. Yeah. But thanks. And just to your distribution, looks like you get some answers. I mean, um, we ca we recently had the AX um, help systems community survey again uh, that asked that question. Um, so there was quite a good percentage on AX 7.2 already. Of course, a lot of them still on 7.1 and then a smaller block still on 6.1 and the fourth block was just, well, stating order where we don't know it's 5.3, uh, 5.2 five, five, and these type of things. Uh, but I would say it, it's quite positive from, from that picture. And just to, just to jump in, if I may, that uh, I can see just one example of that 100 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, it does exist and does have the IX support, uh, for example, for the SN S924. Uh, that, uh, if there's other details needed, then let, let me know, but uh, there's at least one that does exist. Cool. Thanks, David. All right, let me continue with the Power System software highlights then. I guess I touched already on Power VM, right? We put Power VM Enterprise Edition in every server, which allows for smooth migrations to Power 9, and um, workloads are compressed and encrypted, uh, which accelerates LPM and, of course, makes it more secure. Then Power VC. We had several enhancements over the last, I think what's in here is improvements over the last 12 to 15 months. So PowerVC has uh, an export import capabilities, uh, so you could move VMs easily, well, uh, within your data centers, but even uh, in between on and off prem. So you could go into PowerVC in your one data center, export such an image, and import it wherever you want, which could be a different data center within your enterprise or the public cloud, for instance. Um, the integration with Spectrum Scale, I already touched on that enables now that sandless cloud story. Um, since a while, PowerVC supports as well uh, KVM-based systems, so open power systems, which brings the LC boxes into the picture, um, because previously PowerVC was um, limited to managing PowerVM-based systems, right? So now one instance of PowerVC can basically manage mixed environments, and then there was some effort in order to well support for IBM Cloud Private and even integrate better, but we will touch on that in a bit. Then Power SC, which is our portfolio for managing security and compliance in, in cloud and virtualized environments. And we have seen um, quite some traction for, for that portfolio last year. Um, so it provides capabilities around compliance automation to help with industry standards such as HIPAA, PCI, NERF, DOD, or GDPR from an infrastructure standpoint. It has a malware intrusion and detection component where basically it will alert you real time if someone changes a security critical file, um, such as the content or permission level. Um, we had very scalability enhancements because we have really big guys running PowerVC that have about 3,000 VMs 
that was not the way PowerSD was built initially. So we did quite a bit on that and, and then further improved our reporting capabilities to support clients with security audits. Another offering in the PowerSD portfolio is PowerSD multi-factor authentication. That's key because various regulations require that. A federal mandate, a PCI, GDPR asks for it um, implicitly, I would say. Um, so we first provided that just for AAX in 2017, but towards end of last year, we broadened the scope to Linux on Power and the HMC as well. Um, plus we made much more factors available. So now clients can authenticate via uh, a, a touch token, uh, a one-time password on their phone or fingerprint on their phone in order to authenticate. Last pillar, high availability, and we have very, seen various improvements there as well, a lot related to cloud. So PowerHA for AX has a new backup to cloud option. It provides um, failover metrics so that clients can check where was the time spent during such a failover and where they might be able to improve for, for future ones. Um, automated uh, offline backup option, uh, SVC only for now. And of course, yeah, support for one site and multi site deployments. Then we brought a new offering, uh, or let's say two offerings to the HA uh, pillar, which is VM Recovery Manager, which comes in an HA and DR flavor. Um, that basically provides a simplified VM um, restart uh, solution for HA. So in contrast to PowerHA, which sits in the OS, so we have a PowerHA for AX, PowerHA for I, PowerHA for Linux, we have one VM recovery manager for all the operating systems as it's OS agnostic and that thus it's well suited for cloud deployments. Um, it of course provides not the high level um, of uh, availability that PowerHA does, um, but it's a nice compromise I would say for solutions that don't have these high uh, requirements in terms of high availability, but still would like to have an HA solution in place. And it comes with an application monitoring agent for DB2, Oracle, and Sabhana, and well, um, of course, co-location and anti-co-location policy support and these type of things. All right, let's take a step back um, and talk about AX Enterprise Edition for a second. I mean, that was really broadly adopted and it's a very successful offering. As it bundles the AX Based the AX operating system with broadly adopted offerings such as AX, uh, such as PowerVC and PowerSD. So, in the era of cloud and clients really exploiting our power capabilities and bring different workloads onto the same machine and run, for instance, half the box AX and half the box Linux. If you look at the Linux side of things, they purchase their Linux distro of choice but need to purchase all the power system software on top, even the ones that come in form of a compelling package on AX Enterprise Edition. Um, so this and various requests made me come up with the idea of an IBM Power Systems Enterprise Cloud Edition, which basically is an AX Enterprise Edition type of offering, but with a much broader scope in terms of bundled components as well as supported operating systems. Um, it as well simplifies um, the purchasing model because, I mean, what we hear from clients, right, it, it's painful to order one offering after the other. We hear from clients, well, it's very difficult for them to get additional software purchases um, justified after the hardware deal had closed. So for them, it's much easier to purchase a compelling bundle with the box, even though they might not deploy all of them in the beginning. By doing and how this is set up, um, now uh, this bundle is interest, uh, of interest for Linux and Power Clients as well, and IBM I also. Um, as you can see, it's, uh, it's faded out here a bit. The reason for that is that out of four out of the nine components do not support IBM I or do not support IBM I yet, uh, and we are working towards that, so that might become of more interest in terms of IBM I um, at a later point in time. And um, it allows for more licensing flexibility. Um, that relates to what I mentioned earlier. Clients run AX Linux on the same box. So I, I got re uh, requests from clients, could I just put an AX Enterprise type edition offering with just the software components on my whole environment and then more flexibly license 
um, the OS to AX or Linux. And as we touched on Red Hat, right, if we would have acquired Red Hat earlier, I could have come up with a bundle with just an OS license and have both of them included. So that might take it one step further. So quick view on what value does this bundle provide? So first pillar is around simplifying cloud management. So Power VC plays into that pillar, Spectrum Scale, our cloud management console, and cloud app management, which is a non-power product. Um, then another one is simplifying management of security and compliance, where we have Power C and MFA, as well as Big Fix as a non-power product. A whole new pillar around high availability with the VM Recovery Manager for HA and Aspera, which is as well a non-power product uh, that allows us to transfer huge files between distributed data centers at high speed. As mentioned, you can put this on top of any operating system. Um, that, that's the beauty of it. But we as well created a second flavor of the bundle, including AX72 uh, Standard Edition, because we have a lot of clients that would like to move uh, up from AX Enterprise Edition to this cloud bundle. And if you compare it to AX Enterprise Edition, um, there uh, are quite a few components that were added, as you can see. Um, just uh, one slide on the cloud management console. Uh, a lot of clients uh, or more and more clients using it these days, some still have not heard about it. So we started to talk about that when we launched our uh, Power 8 cloud models. At that point in time, we talked about HMC um, uh, capabilities as a server, a service or Power Cloud apps. So this is basically a software as a service offering through which we deliver microservices or apps. At the moment, we have basically these four available um, as a software as a service, nothing to install or maintain on-prem. And what it does, it allows you to connect all your HMCs, and some of our clients have more than 100 of them, and get an aggregated view of your environment. And Log Trends, this one for me makes it the most visible. So with CMC, you could answer questions such as, how many LPMs are my people doing? How long do they take? So that helps for future planning. Or how many LPMs fail? What was the top reason code? Maybe it's always a network issue and I just need to increase the bandwidth. Without such a thing as CMC, you need to SSH into each HMC separately, search the logs in order to find commonalities. Um, and for these as well, we have created new monthly packs in AS eConfig uh, for um, uh, in simplified ordering experience. One thing we have done is we extended the cloud management dashboard, so to speak, that has on the left-hand side the software as a service apps to accommodate as well launch plans for our on-prem offerings. Because what clients said, well, it's great, you have PowerHA, you have PowerC, all the UIs look alike, but it's all complete separate. Could, couldn't you not bring them closer together? Uh, and yeah, we are working towards that. And the first step was like, create a central launch point. And what we heard from clients is even though separate teams manage PowerSC or VC or HA, all of them use um, CMC, so it's good to have them side by side. Um, okay, that was basically covering uh, the power components out of these bundles. If you're interested in, I have a whole deck explaining as well in more detail all of the components, in particular as well um, the non power components as well, and I have reference links in the back as well. So with that, basically, we are left with three options, how to purchase AX, AX Standard Edition, um, continues to be marketed as is perpetual or in form of the AX Monthly options. AX Enterprise Edition continues to be marketed as is for now, um, but the set of bundled components won't, won't change. And now we have the AX Cloud Edition as a third option, and that one might supersede AX Enterprise Edition at some point. And of course, all of them are orderable as AX needs Power VM on Power VM based servers. The Cloud Edition is, is only available on Power 8 and above. All right, then we have the AX modernization block. And I just put a couple of areas here um, covering, um, yeah, AX in the cloud, AX in the hyperconverged space, AX and containers, AX and open source, and AX 
um, or better phrase enterprise systems and AI. Um, so on the open source end, I do not want to talk through all the details, just we are making uh, new packages available um, continuously. Uh, we have plans um, already for what, what will be next. Um, we committed to providing uh, security related fixes um, uh, in a timely fashion, right? So uh, we re re reviewed a lot of TVs and provided packages. And what we did as well as we worked towards better compatibility uh, between different download sites, such as both Freeware or Purcell from Michael Purcell um, and these type of things. And then, of course, we have the cloud automation block where we contribute to Chef Ansible and started to contribute to Puppet a second half of last year if clients prefer to do so instead of um, proprietary offerings. This just gives an overview of what we all did in 2018 in terms of new packages or updated packages, so that's more for your reference. One thing that's somewhat open source related, I would say, and uh, I, uh, we talked earlier, Nigel did a very detailed session on that. I just wanted to, it to mention um, that basically client could use NJMON for modern performance steps tooling. Um, and JMON is basically the same thing as NMON, but saving to JSON format, which allows to dump the output basically in uh, stats databases such as InfluxDB and then use Grafana for nice, uh, nice um, graphic displays. And as there was some enablement um, added recently for TPS, for instance, now you can basically um, get uh, data from all kinds of sources um, and integrate it in, in such a uh, web graph such as, well, HMC data um, and, and metrics from there and other sources. Um, cloud, if we look at that picture, it would have looked quite a bit lighter about a year ago or one and a half years ago. What you can see in the yellow circle is really our private cloud story and the enablement um, for, for everything else. Um, and then you can, of course, see higher level cloud orchestrators and third party we, we, we work with um, because we have uh, a lot of clients that have power and x86 in place, right? That use VMware, we realize um, to manage the x86, but as well power environment uh, that was available since a while. It had limitations because uh, VMware realized had no insights into the workload running in VMs. It could just start and stop and these type of things. But now we extended that with VMware realized operations for power, um, which makes it much more attractive as well. Plus the partnership with Red Hat and well, soon, um, well, Red Hat will be acquired. So let me talk to some of the details here, first starting with, with AX in the hyperconverged space where we basically enabled mid of last year selected AX workloads to run on Nutanix um, infrastructure as well. The whole idea behind that is, uh, well, modernization, but as well simplifying management because with the Nutanix Prism interface, you can manage power and x86 environments and power that used to be lim limited to Linux on power mid of last year, now AX as well. So basically we added AX um, as another guest OS under PRISM um, and currently support basically um, custom app consolidation and dev tech users and enable selected middleware as well and gathering feedback on, well, what else clients would like to see there. A similar use case to what, um, what Nutanix provides is AX in the public cloud and what we did with SkyTap, but just in a public cloud environment because SkyTap has basically this web-based user interface that you can see there and you can manage VMs across x86 uh, and, and power in a unified fashion which yeah, simplifies the management of uh, mixed environments. That was out since one and a half years or so. So a couple of weeks back, we announced AX in the IBM cloud. Finally, uh, uh, we uh, sometimes take longer than one would think. Um, so this offering is called IBM Power Systems Virtual Server on IBM Cloud. It provides AX and IBM I Power VM based VMs as a service on IBM Cloud. Um, you can see the details here, of course, that's to extend um, AX and IBM I to the public cloud uh, from, from within IBM, right? So that you can run 
uh, some workloads on prem that you would like to keep there, but as well could move AX and IBM I workloads as well to the public cloud in case you would like to do so. Um, I touched on higher level cloud orchestrators such as the VMware Realize and Ratchet OpenShift and basically our in-house multi-cloud manager is IBM Cloud Private uh, to spin up uh, cloud native apps, containerized solutions that can be deployed on VMs that have been created with well, PowerVC or Nutanix or pure OpenStack um, or even on top of VMs um, running on Z um, or, or x86 um, and what we have in place because a lot of times I start talking about this um, clients think well that's Linux only um, and not of interest to me what I just wanted to point out that there are APIs existing to to access data and workloads residing on AAX and IBM I and I think David will talk to that a little bit more in a second and because all people think, well, it's just containers. No, ICP can as well spin up and down VMs um, in case clients would like to do so. So let me stop my sharing and hand over to David so that he can um, advance his own slides. Okay, presenter, you should be able to um, share now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, just that while you. Good. Just while you're doing that transition, there have been quite a lot of questions um, and David uh, has been uh, answering quite a lot of them um, and I've answered a couple as well. So keep them coming via the chat window and we'll try and um, get through the, the questions. And if there's things that we haven't answered, please feel free to contact us afterwards as well. So chat window is the place. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you, thank you, Jyoti. Thank you, Petra. So yes, I'll, I'll move on from this slide to talking about at the IBM Cloud Private. As Petra's mentioned, this is something which kind of has a perception around it, which is a little bit about microservices. Uh, and there's a perception, after all, that microservices might not necessarily be something you would involve with with the likes of AIX. But just as, as an example, there, there is a piece within and uh, ha, 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 there we are. There is a piece within the IBM, and the actual uh, IBM Cloud Private, uh, which is called the Cloud Automation Manager uh, (CAM), which again expands beyond the sort of base basic piece of being able to do the container apps and actually brings in the capability to be able to manage the VM-based systems such as Oracle and other things you'd expect to see within AIX moving forward as well. So you can use this actually to be able to do that deployment. Uh, you can see that they actually that they have got the VM-based systems here. You've also got the ability to add AIX and IBM I using that kind of catalog process within IBM Cloud Private. Uh, you can do the existing uh, services should you wish, uh, coordinating the orchestration for not just the new apps that might well be referencing through the APIs that the better were just mentioning back to the, the, the sort of AIX instances, but you can also actually do that through the AIX instances themselves. Uh, so you can do the self-service interface and align them with, with the modern infrastructure and to integrate them into clusters of whatever you might be needing to be used. Um, so uh, we, I can breathe the kind of well, um, it's a debate. It, it's always helpful when the questions come in because it does stop me talking quite so fast. So yes, yeah, very reasonable. Um, so. Uh, as an example, one of the, the individuals here in the UK who focuses particularly on Oracle, a gentleman called Jason Garforth, he's taken it upon it uh, to be able to, to take the, this piece of work. Uh, hello? Just reminding you to slow down a bit, we got uh, a pig in, in, in the chat. <laughs> Because I go too fast. Yes, very fair. I shall try. Uh, so we have uh, the piece of work that Jason has been working on, uh, and uh, we, sh we shall see, which is taking an example of the use of CAM to be able to redeploy Oracle workloads. So the idea here is that we can use ICP and the CAM element of that to provision on and off premise for Oracle workloads. Uh, so we can do that on Power using Power VC through the OpenStack kind of inter interaction. You could do that on System Z, again, with OpenStack. Uh, you've got the storage handled by OpenStack. Uh, we can also do, should you really want to, uh, you could put Oracle onto the Oracle VMs on x86, again, all through OpenStack. And you have also got the capability to be able to provision these out onto clouds. So we can use with, uh, with Oracle, with the full uh, database uh, priest and also the Fusion middleware, we can use Chef and Ansible and Puppets. Uh, we can do the e-business suite. Uh, we can do, uh, using Docker, we, we can actually provide that out into elsewhere, should you want to have elements, of course, which are working elsewhere 
elsewhere uh, outside of power systems. You can have that on Docker with Chef, with, with Oracle VM templates. We could even go out onto the world of the, uh, the public cloud. Now, of course, I'm about to go on in a second to why that's not necessarily such a good idea. But at least you are able, with this kind of process of re being able to do the redeployments, you have the options. Uh, you have the ability to be able to do this kind of piece where you can put redeploy them. And therefore, if you have a question coming in uh, about a, a cloud uh, first strategy, you have the capability to be able to move them around. Then, of course, once you have that capability, the question comes up about what is the best place to actually put that database and what is the best, best actually best fit uh, for the applications you're talking about. And we can also work with Terraform, so we can support anything Terraform supports with this. So it's just one example of how that piece of ICP, uh, known as CAM, can be used for workloads you actually would normally run with AIX, and it doesn't have to just be about microservices. So we can also do uh, the kind of microservice kind of world uh, actually with AIX these days. Uh, so what we can manage here uh, that, uh, that Petra has been working with the team behind the scenes uh, to be able to enable is we are capable of being able to redeploy uh, instances of AIX uh, using the WPAR technology to be able to recreate and to actually move forward in that uh, container space. So what we're talking about is being able to deploy WPARs into Kubernetes pods. Uh, these are stored in a kind of Docker repository, but of course we're not working directly with Docker itself here uh, because we are working with the power, uh, power processors and therefore the power architecture. But uh, it would make perfect sense, of course, uh, as you move forward into modernizing your various applications that are running today within AIX to be able to move forward with the use of microservices. And so that world of containers is not something we have to shy away from. We can totally begin to work with the microservices world inside of AIX by using the, the, the make, uh, making use of WPARs and therefore looking at the individual application layers and the individual um, elements of, of your solution and put them into, into these kind of WPARs, put them into the Kubernetes uh, pods and be able to combine in that overarching world, uh, which is actually controlled by the Kubernetes process and therefore modernize your applications moving forward. So we can use uh, microservices with AIX and of course we can also use the, the more traditional Oracle database of this world also being able to be handled by ICP as well. So that brings me to cloud, of course, uh, because cloud is something which, uh, which we need to be working with. Cloud is, is a reality uh, that we all need to be handling. As the cloud accelerates business transformation, it allows us to be able to innovate with the latest technology uh, from any source. Uh, we can work with the kind of analytics and AI kind of worlds, and again, more about AI and AI just a little bit later on. And potentially, it can also improve return on existing investments. But all that said, how much percentage of actual enterprise workloads have actually moved to the cloud to date. And the, the result, the answer from McKinsey so far, is the answer is actually as low as 20%. Uh, so there's a re research, as I say, not from IBM, but externally done, to show that only 20% of enterprise workloads have actually moved to the cloud so far. And of those that have, uh, what we have also seen are quite a lot of people reconsidering uh, their, their drive straight to the cloud, their cloud-first kind of strategy, off into the public clouds, in that about 38% of enterprises that have moved workloads uh, from the public cloud are actually moving them back into the data centers. And the main reason for doing so is because actually it didn't save them as much money as they were expecting. Indeed, as I would like to show you, it can be a very expensive proposition to move certain workloads into the public cloud. So it's not necessarily the sort of thing that's actually going to give you a lot of money back. And again, this is not IBM saying this. This is not us as the IX specialists uh, sort of making this claim. This is a, a fully external uh, point of view from BMC uh, that's, something that's published here, as you can see the link below from Forbes. So it's not just us, uh, it's actually a, a sort of general concern. So the drive straight to public cloud isn't necessarily the route to saving as much money as it might be perceived to do so to begin with. The, the kind of summary and point of why that's the case are kind of laid out like this. We have these Power 9 processors uh, available across the board. They are extremely fast and much faster than the competitive alternatives. If they're that much faster, and they are, then you need fewer cores to be able, and that means you can lower your software costs. Uh, large portions of software, after all, remain charged by the processor, Oracle being a good example, but it's certainly not alone, and therefore you can actually end up lowering the costs considerably if you make use of the Power9 processors because you need fewer of them and therefore end up with a lower cost. 
The virtualization, of course, that we're all doing with our power boxes all, all across the world um, is one of the ways that the cloud providers can make money. Uh, they can do use the, the ability of virtualization to overcommit the processor resources. Uh, they can then choose how they want to then pass that charge back to you as you come in and normally purchase some form of virtual CPU. And so what that's, uh, the overcommitment is a method by which cloud providers are able to make, make pennies. Uh, you, of course, uh, with your IBM Power Systems uh, on the, the private cloud world, can absolutely keep the benefit for yourselves as well. Uh, we see uh, customers all around the world uh, doing very heavy overcommitment of processors because of the, the strength of Power VM, uh, being able to do sort of three times or more uh, overcommitment of processors because it's perfectly normal and standard practice. And so you can keep that benefit with your own private cloud on your Power Systems and therefore save a lot of cash. You then need to watch out for how software is licensed in some of the clouds. Uh, so the likes of Amazon Web Services, the Azures, uh, that's not necessarily by the core. It may well be by the threat, and I'll expand on that in just a moment. And that can considerably increase your software costs as well. Uh, so these are layers you need to check out for. And then, of course, how long are you staying? Uh, that uh, even our, on our own offerings uh, for AIX and IBMI coming out in the public cloud, uh, if you stay there for a full three years, then the expectation should be that it will be more expensive uh, than actually uh, just doing this on-premise. Obviously, there's the trade-off there about uh, the, the fact that you don't need to buy the data center and you don't need to pay for the power and you don't need to pay for the people. So these are, are numbers that need to be weighed up. Uh, but are you going to be doing this for a very short period of time? If so, then the kind of taxi idea of just using a car for a very short period of time makes absolute sense. But if you're going to be running this fairly consistently for about three years or so or longer, then it's the sort of thing where the costs need to be looked at, because it may well actually be more of a cost effective to stay on uh, on-premise using a, a, a private cloud on-premise than actually going out into the public cloud. So let's have a little look David. at some of the details. Yes, David, me? just sorry to interrupt, just to um, allow you to take, catch your breath. Um, someone in I was the going slow there for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say I've heard you speak a lot faster, but, um, but one of the participants is um, asking me why I've overclocked you. <laughs> and, and he's asking me to reset you and restart with not native speaker compatible mode enabled. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, I, I, I just thought it was worth sharing that. So I found it very funny. Um, so thank you I'm for that. Well and. Um, <laughs> uh, what I would say is that this session is being recorded and uh, will be posted to YouTube channel and you can actually watch the, the video in um, slower speed mode if, if you wish. But um, yeah, <laughs> there we go. If you have any questions, please post them onto the chat window. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Very fair. No, but the, the, the interruption is, is, is very fair and very reasonable. Uh, I, I, yes, as, as you know, Jyoti, I can, in the UK, end up talking even faster than this. But yes, I, it's not fair on the audience, as it's far more important that the audience understands what I'm trying to say than I get through my slides. So yes, I, I, I accept the point entirely. Uh, a little experiment that I'm still to do is trying to see if Watson's speech to text can handle what I say. I don't think it can, but I can always try it out at some point. So again, I shall, I shall endeavor to slow myself down a bit more. So moving on from the main point, I want to look at a little bit of detail about uh, the, the using Oracle databases as one example, also IBM's WebSphere application server as another example, to look at how this actually comes out if I you know, look at the, the Amazon Web Services offerings that exist today. So the answer comes out really that Oracle on power systems, on, uh, which can be either on-premise or indeed provided by a cloud system provider, can be in the realm of about 3.6 times more expensive on AWS than it would be on your power boxes. Uh, that, as you can see, varies depending on how you choose to, to take your Oracle from Amazon Web Services. If you use the, the bare metal uh, offerings and then deploy your own Oracle license to them, that is, a, frankly, a very expensive way to do this. Alternatively, the, the, the sort of second a block coming in from the left here, the big blue one, that's the cost if you were to look at taking Oracle as a service uh, back from AWS. Uh, so that is then moving across to my two power offerings. You can see they are both considerably cheaper. And at least at this point of proceedings, this is actually showing the IBM Power Systems hardware at list price. Uh, 
which it's possible you might not actually end up paying for. So how did I get to that kind of answer? I will answer it in a moment. Uh, also, you can look at uh, the kind of world of looking at things on other clouds as well, but I'll come back to that a little bit later on. It can also be more expensive there too. And so is it real? That's a key question, of course, for the technical audience that I'm talking to at the moment, because uh, what I don't want to do is just show you marketing charts. So I have to move from the scale of, uh, to be slightly politically incorrect, uh, the political positions can not necessarily tell the truth all the time. Uh, I am therefore looking to try and make sure I'm not just targeting, uh, targeting marketing kind of material here. I am therefore making use of statistics. Uh, the statistics that I use here are there to try and keep the results that I'm coming out with as real and defendable as possible. And so again, I'll come back to how I get to that in a second. There is use of statistics, there is uh, use of assumptions, but I'll try and expose what they are as I move forward. So we know that the initial sort of challenge of the total cost of acquisition, how much it costs to buy some of our power boxes, can initially look vastly more expensive than compared to individual offerings you might be able to get from the cloud. So on the far left here, I have the, the cost of, of buying uh, these different kinds of offerings from Amazon Web Services. So you could buy an individual bare metal uh, solution uh, that's got a, an, a kind of sort of four, four uh, virtual processors, four cores rather, and eight virtual processors back from Amazon Web Services. They're, they're M5, 2X large. It doesn't cost very much at all. Uh, then if you were to add the database as a service, it's a bit more expensive, uh, but again, these look a lot cheaper than some of my big power boxes coming across to the right. Uh, the very, uh, very reassuringly expensive, shall we say, uh, biggest of the E980s, uh, that of course is where I'm using all 12 uh, cores active in those power boxes, and there is a, a price premium to pay for making uh, all of the cores active. You can see that actually if I use uh, the, the systems where I do again have 16 chips, but 128 cores active, you can see that's quite a lot cheaper to buy. But nonetheless, it looks many, many times more expensive than the individual offerings from Amazon Web Services to begin with. And so how do I end up showing that these things can come out uh, cost effective at the end of the day? So part of the answer, uh, as I started off with, is that power systems have much faster processors within them. So I'm not going to go into the detail of how I looked up these particular processor numbers at this point, uh, that actually I'm not doing that because the method that I'm going to be using going forward is now different from what I did for the, when I created this material at the time. There was a kind of transition of what we had available to us for these kind of independent processor numbers. But what I did with this was use a, a combination of some benchmark material that I could get access to uh, combined with our perf numbers. But we have a, a new way of being able to access that from, from IDC, which I'll be uh, using going forward. But the answers are, are really always coming out about the same. We're looking at something like double the speed per core, depending on the offerings you're looking at, uh, compared to the, the uh, Intel processors that are running at the back of AWS. So our processors are faster. That means we need fewer of them. That means we can save on software charges. Uh, so the speed alone of the processors doesn't necessarily change the world around, but you can see that I need quite a few of the Amazon Web Services instances, 57 in this case, to be able to match the, the amount of workloads I could potentially put into my 128-core uh, E980. Uh, so that's uh, something where I can balance them out, uh, back and forth and see where we go from there. Uh, then, of course, there's the question actually about partitioning. Uh, I talked about the fact that we have the ability to be able to do overcommitment, and that requires us to do partitioning. So I just want to, to, to look at that for a second. Um, we have uh, published in our Oracle's own uh, blogs, so you can check out where this comes from. They have their, part, their policy when it comes to the use of VMware. Uh, VMware is soft partitioning as far as Oracle is concerned, and they have a distinction between hard and soft, uh, and that's explained in the Oracle PDF file. That means uh, that you can potentially get to the stage of uh, that uh, VM, VMware uh, can actually be seen again as uh, soft partitioning, and you can end up needing to be rather careful about how you end up licensing Oracle, potentially across the entire vCenter server footprint of all the different servers that are running Oracle in that particular cluster. Uh, so when Oracle say this, then these are the kinds of things you need to be careful of. Uh, we need to be able to make sure you're looking at how the infrastructure is actually rolled out. You need to totally isolate the Oracle products in their VMware infrastructure if you were to use Oracle in VMware. 
and then you certainly require a certain volume of business to be able to validate the customer infrastructure schema. So again, to check with Oracle to see whether what you're doing is actually validated by what they're actually saying at this point. So what is totally isolating Oracle products when it comes to VMware? What you need to do is you need to have a dedicated vCenter server instance with dedicated physical hosts for just your Oracle. You need to have a dedicated VLAN, and you also need to have a storage isolation through the LAN masking and zoning for any approval restrictions. So you need to be very careful if you're going to be using Oracle with VMware that you don't end up needing to pay for all the different servers in your entire vCenter cluster, uh, because that is a possibility. And so these are the rules you try and follow uh, with, uh, with Oracle. But it's much easier if you use it on IBM Power Systems. Uh, that, again, referring to Oracle's own information, uh, the Oracle software stack is supported on the deployments of IBM Power systems uh, because uh, the IBM LPAR technology uh, with, with the micropartitioning is seen as hard uh, partitioning. Uh, so it's approved hard partitioning. Uh, we've got the, the DLPAR process and the micropartitions are all seen as hard partitioning. There is then that point that it makes about capped partitions only. And so then I can refer back to this independent view of what that actually means. Uh, as the Software One are not IBM. They're an independent company who specialize in understanding how the licensing terms are actually interpreted. And where their view is, is that when Oracle are talking about these different partitions, uh, they're actually all of the LPAR technologies should be seen as hard, uh, whether that is uh, capped or uncapped. It's a kind of mix of how these, use, these terms are used. And so their point of view is that actually we can use uncapped LPARs and still call them hard partitions. We know there's then the question about LPM. So there's the live partition ability, which is a recent change or fairly recent change to Oracle's guidelines. And so what they said there was that if you're running LPM on systems, you may end up not having the ability to do hard partitions anymore. But we can choose. We can be selective about how LPM is run on selected partitions. Since a certain type of the, the HMC code came out, we can go in and select individual partitions and say that these are not eligible for LPM, ensuring that we keep Oracle as hard partitioned. And that means we can get the benefit of that CPU over commitment and be able to come in continue to re reduce the number of processors we actually need and therefore the number of Oracle licenses. We, of course, in IBM have been working alongside Oracle for many, many years. We have three different uh, forms of Oracle Competency Center around the world, and just one of the offerings they come out with uh, is the, the ability to be able to have the tips and considerations for current versions of Oracle running on AIX, because it's where most Oracle around the world actually ends up actually running is inside of AIX, and so we have these tips and considerations for how to do it. Then how do I actually work out how many processors I actually do need? And warning, there's have some statistics ahead. Originally, I used to put the link to this particular document uh, about where I got my information about the uh, utilization and how I, uh, how I statistically model it, uh, but the links keep moving. So what I've done now is embedded the PDF into this particular document. Uh, we have had a couple of requests for the PPTs, uh, so if you do want the presentation version, you're welcome to, to ask me for them, and then you'll find the PDF actually written in there. So I created uh, by one of the gentlemen that created this was a chap called Roger Rogers, still working inside of IBM last time I checked, and so he is a competitive analyst for our IT economic studies, uh, consolidation, uh, platform selection, chargeback, and security. Actually, not a, not a power systems man, generally I'm sort of more focused on the mainframe, but what I'm about to go through isn't actually tied to any particular uh, hardware architecture. Instead, it's actually talking about things which are just generic to, to this different servers, but scale does help. So how would you size things in the first place? Uh, you'd normally need to size an individual virtual machine to be able to handle uh, the, 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 the upper levels of how busy it might get. So workloads, of course, vary. Uh, sometimes they're, they're running in peak. Sometimes they're not uh, particularly busy. They do vary over time. And so you might need to size your, your systems to be able to handle a certain level of peaks. Uh, so a, a reasonable sort of balance between being able to handle any peak and handle common peaks might be to take stu two uh, standard deviations out from the norm. That will roughly cover a 95% SLA of what your systems might peak to. And so you'd size your, your individual virtual machines to two standard deviations above the mean to handle peak workloads. Then how variable are they? Uh, so again, uh, again, from working to, to some fairly old, but, but I think still useful uh, survey of, how, of what actually happens with different servers, you can look at variability on different kinds of workloads. So databases here from this survey of about 3,200 different servers had interesting levels of average utilization and interesting levels of peak. And what I'm actually talking about are the variability numbers, that the sigma values uh, in the, the right-hand column here. So databases had a variability of about 3.25. 
How do you then use that? Well, as you pull a number of different, different virtual machines all together on a large uh, virtualized server, you can actually see that bringing all those workloads together and the way that the peaks happen at different times mean that you can see the, the averages kind of scale with the number of workloads you come in fairly linearly, but the peaks can actually be compressed. Uh, you can see that the peaks actually scale instead of with, uh, directly with the number of workloads, they scale with the square root of the number of workloads. So the more workloads you have on an individual server, the better your utilization levels can be. This is kind of working out to look at if I had eight different sort of separate servers, I could have these out on the cloud in different virtual instances, and each one of these might have an average utilization of, say, 17, and their peak might be six times that average. So we tightly pack them together, because that's the option we really prefer, is to tightly pack them together in our power systems boxes to be able to have the peaks happen at different times and make best use of our resources. So if I take eight of them, pull them all together onto one system, then what happens is that I bring all those workloads together and the average rises to about 36, but the peak is actually no longer so high up. It's now about 2.76 times the average. So 16 cores are delivering the workloads of 32, giving me a two to one overcommitment. Pretty easy on a power systems box because of course eight workloads is not very many. So let's up that to 16, uh, 16 different workloads, and that overcommitment ability is rising. And so we can kind of come up with seeing how many more we've got, more workloads. The different colors here, here, uh, show actually that the, the, sp the spikes are happening at different times. And so my little dotted line at the top right-hand corner is rising up. So I go up from 16, again, so you can see that rising up there. If I go up from 16 to 64, which again is a perfectly normal number of workloads to be able to have on a decent sized power box, you can see that I've now achieved 3.5 uh, uh, overcommitment, 72 cores delivering the workload of what looks like 256. Average utilization of 60, peak of 16025. And that's that kind of thing that we can do on a very standard basis inside of a, of a power system to drive up that utilization. If you have the workloads to do it, you can achieve very high levels of uh, average utilization. And the peak doesn't need to be that much higher above that, giving you fewer cores, and that has a direct correlation with the number of software licenses. So again, these things are just rising up. So the math behind this, and this is normally something that is a bit unpleasant for, for those that haven't had to look at math at this in, in recent years, but it's a key point I'd be very happy if you would take away and use this, the, the, the formula here. If you need to re revalidate where it came from, happy to step that through, or if you just want to take it and use it, that's the ideal as far as I'm concerned. Taking from that document by Roger Rogers, total capacity, mean times the number of workloads, plus two times sigma with the square root of the number of workloads. That's the difference between the mean and the average, so I'm moving them forward there. So I can combine the mean and the peaks. Then I know that the, the sigma is the uh, combination of variability and the mean uh, workloads of the individual systems. And so my total capacity can, can be this, it can be it's just that simple mass there. Now what I did was I went back round and flipped it on its head because we know the total capacity we might try and drive towards. Maybe we try and drive our, our actual power boxes up to a kind of target utilization of maybe 90%, perfectly normal in a big enterprise box. We know the variability because these are databases, so we know that 3.25 is the variability I can use, and we know the mean demand of each workload. So individual workloads coming in, having an average utilization of maybe a, a small number of cores, and then we can spread those workloads across a big box. So here's the rather nasty maths that, again, I don't necessarily need you to be able to step through and be able to resolve yourself because I've done that workload for you. But what it means is that I can calculate based on the things we know, based on the total capacity we're aiming for, based on the variability, based on the mean demand, I can come up with how many workloads I can fit onto each server. And the bigger the box, the larger the number of workloads, the better the actual utilization and the smaller the number of cores. So again, a bit unpleasant uh, about the math there, but feel free to steal and use as required. So it gives us the number of servers, because I know how many workloads I've got, and if I know how many workloads can go onto an individual server, I know how many boxes I need, and that means I can work out my total numbers. So that's what happens here, is that what I've done here is use that maths. I've got 150 different uh, Amazon Web Services instances, be that the bare metal or the versions providing the, the database back as a service, and I can then end up using that to be able to size my power systems boxes, because I can use that virtualization to show that I might need two of the, the medium-sized E950s or just one of these great big systems. Then, of course, I can David? use that capacity. So, yes, indeed. Sorry, I'm just um, going to interrupt you so you can catch your breath again. Um, if anyone's got any more questions, there are some coming through onto the chat window, but um, please uh, put them on the, on the chat window and we'll take them at the end um, rather than interrupt um, David in mid-flow. Um, and a quick reminder, David, to just um, 
take it a bit slower. Uh, it's getting a little complicated now. Thank you. Yeah, you did say you wanted technical, and this is a variation on technical after all. So this is not the version I didn't think. That was slightly higher level. Uh, so yes, I can use, if I've worked out how many pro servers I need, and I've worked out what my utilization of these different boxes can be, then of course, on my big enterprise power systems, I can use capacity on demand to right size. So I can come down on my E980s, for example, they could have 128 cores uh, installed within the servers, but if I've sized it for this kind of process to be able to see how many I actually need, because I've driven a nice high level of utilization with those existing processors, I might only need 69 active cores. And that's the kind of uh, comparison I can make is 150 different uh, Amazon Web Service instances I can actually satisfy with 69 power cores, and then I'm comparing 600 Intel processors in the cloud with 69 on my E980. Then actually, what are these different processors, particularly in Amazon Web Services land? So if you look in, in the detail, you can discover that uh, what the, the virtual processors are, what the software is charged against. And since they are now using hyper-threading inside of Amazon Web Services, you can see that actually a virtual CPU is not a processor, it's not a core, it's actually a thread. And that's something that re recurs on a number of these different cloud offerings. Is it's not actually processors, they're threads. So then, and then how do you pay for your software? The threads are where you actually end up paying. So again, we're matching up the information from Amazon, matching up the information from Oracle. You can see that they license their Oracle software against the virtual CPUs. We just showed you that a virtual CPU is a thread and not a processor. So we used to have a challenge where you would maybe have to get over the fact that I have one Oracle license uh, for each one of my Power 9 processors. I can actually have the same at the end of the day inside of the cloud offerings. Uh, that because the vCPU is a thread and they have hyper-threading uh, used, we actually have, again, one Oracle license for each one of those Intel processors behind the scenes. And the same thing is true for, for Azure as well, and other, Oracle, uh, other uh, cloud providers uh, do the same thing. So this is double because of the performance of Power 9, we're much faster than Intel, then double because we actually don't charge by the thread, we charge by the processor with power when they charge with a thread inside of the, uh, the cloud offerings, and that has a profound effect on how many Oracle licenses you end up needing. So here's where I apply the software. So on the left-hand side, I've applied the standard, just the, so far, the Oracle database costs and support itself. So my, my big bar on the left-hand side, I start off with bare metal uh, Amazon Web Services instances, apply that database to it, and you can see it gets very expensive. The second bar is where Amazon Web Services are providing Oracle back as a service. And you can see, again, it's actually still fairly expensive compared to my different power offerings. And as I mentioned before, I am still using a list price for my power boxes here, and therefore they can come down from there quite a bit. So that's, that's Oracle. And then I can add on, on top of the database itself, I can expand into the Oracle rack stack itself, because it's not normally just Oracle you might want. And of course, instances in the cloud can and do fail. Therefore, you might want to use rack where supported, because uh, actually it's not supported with the, the, uh, the uh, Oracle as a service from AWS. Uh, the AWS DB is just database, not rack. Uh, but if you wanted to use rack, then you can see that the software layerings get very, very deep and can be very, very expensive compared to the hardware offering and power is coming out very nicely indeed. You then probably want N plus one if you're gonna do rack and therefore you can see how that kind of builds up. So is it just racks that does this? Well, no, it's not. Uh, the actual IBM software is charged in a very similar way. So if you have software that is for PVUs, it is for processor value units, uh, as things like uh, the, our own WebSphere application server is charged, then again, we charge the PVUs against the virtual CPUs, which on the surface of it looks a perfectly uh, an, an straightforward comparison. But you do need to bear in mind that that virtual CPU is potentially a thread, not a processor. So that's how it looks, therefore, if I was to do Amazon Web Services, sorry, if I was to do WebSphere application services not on uh, the offerings from AWS. I've done something a little bit unfair in my second column here in that uh, the AWS DB is, of course, actually something that is just for the Oracle instances, so, uh, but I would use bare metal to be able to add in uh, the WebSphere application server, which is why they're the same, but very expensive because I need lots and lots of PVUs compared to the number of PVUs I would need on my power boxes. And then what I can do is, and maybe I'm doing uh, the, uh, the N plus one version of WAS, and then I can bring them all together. So I can combine on my power boxes, and I can use my virtualization technology to have my application servers sitting alongside uh, the, the Oracle database servers, and therefore driving nice high levels of utilization 
don't need that many servers, don't need that many cores, and so I can come out with a very effective total cost of ownership over three years. Final thing for this detailed version is that, of course, I can then wheel in my, my friendly salesman, because uh, I've been saying, as I say, that the individual instances of the, the power boxes are all sitting here at list price, so they can come in and maybe apply uh, maybe a 30% discount. Other discounts are also available. And so you can see that the results come out uh, varying, but something in the region of uh, three, maybe four times more expensive to run this combination of, of Oracle and, and, and web, web Three application server on the Amazon Web Service instances compared to my power offerings. Uh, so that's, that's how that kind of builds up. I won't go through the same level of detail, particularly in the interest of time, of course, but I can look at Azure. Uh, I can look at Azure. Azure has something very similar. They have their virtual CPUs, which I can find the details of if you, if you dig into their, their documentation. Uh, then also they have a rather peculiar world of nesting. There are different levels of virtual CPU inside of each other, so it gets rather confusing as to what a vCPU here is. In my model, I kind of just assumed that it's still a thread because I couldn't quite get my head around the different layerings of nesting that seems to take place that that adds quite a layer of confusion. But I stick with it, the, the, the process of that they are threads, not processors, because again, you can see that they're using hyper-threading here. Then this is the kind of thing that, again, I can put the comparison on. So here's how it works on a processor speed. Azure used slower processors than Amazon Web Services, and both of them are considerably slower than Power 9 servers. So again, I have the, the benefit of having faster processors, needing fewer processors, lowering software costs, and that's how the TCO builds up. So this is how the kind of offering coming back uh, from Azure might look if you were to run Oracle in that kind of instance. What happens here is because the processors are slower, I need to have larger instances from Azure. So I've needed to go up to an eight core version instead of the four core version I use in Amazon Web Services, and then I have to license those cores. So therefore I have a considerable Oracle cost in, if I was to do this in Azure to be able to keep, keep the comparison the same. So it's about 5.4 times more expensive to run Oracle databases inside of Azure than it is on, on, on power systems. Uh, I can do the same thing again with the, the, the PVU-based software, exactly the same process. You need lots and lots of charges here and to be able to move forward. So again, I can run it much more cheaply on my power, bo power boxes, and then I combine them together. Same thing as I did before, put a little discount across the power systems, and I end up with needing vastly lower costs. You can see the numbers are really quite scary uh, on the left-hand side here for the Azure combination, uh, and nearly 10 times cheaper to run it on the power boxes compared to the uh, offerings from Azure. The Oracle uh, database coming back from Oracle itself is done in a slightly different way, but we can still come out very effectively here too. Uh, they don't have the same threading problem, but they do have other challenges, so I shall just take you through that. Again, they use the Intel processors behind the scenes. You can get the details of what those processors are, and our, our Power 9 processors are considerably faster, 2.55 times faster than the processors used uh, to run the Intel offerings from the Oracle Cloud. Uh, again, we can also do this against other things such as Exadata, but here I'm looking at the cloud. Uh, that means, again, that I could look at Oracle Bare Metal, or I could look at the, the Oracle process of handing back Oracle as a service, and in all cases, I come out being cheaper using Powerboxes than I do compared to Oracle on the cloud, on their own cloud, either bare metal or as a service, something like 3.6 times cheaper. Then am I actually just using the standard database itself so I can see different charges for different things, or might I want again to be able to look at the use of Oracle Rack? So they have different editions, and so I can get the standard package uh, at the low price, uh, but to come in and start using uh, the kind of enterprise edition of, of what I'm doing with uh, Oracle, which is what I normally use for most of my, my references, I need to step up to that second tier of software charging. Then as I step through the different offerings and move all the way up to the extreme performance package, the extreme performance package is when Oracle Rack comes back in. Uh, Oracle view this, after all, as something to enable performance. I think we'd probably normally view it as something to enable reliability, which is something you need to consider using these Intel-based systems that are sitting in the cloud. And all the stuff that's in red there, those are all uh, Oracle software packages, which I haven't used in my uh, model with because my customers that I've been working with haven't normally chosen to have all these different bits of software uh, in, uh, deployed on their on-premise environments. If you choose to buy it back from Oracle in the cloud, you don't get a choice. You have to get, uh, have to pay for all these different software packages, regardless of what you actually were after. So if you wanted to get to Rack, all that stuff in red and the black is what you end up having to pay for. 
You can do it yourself. You can be selective and choose which one you want to pay for. So this is how that comes out, is that I end up in a kind of world. Uh, I can see the question pop up about data center costs. Yes, I, I did absolutely consider the data center costs very reasonable, because after all, if I am going to be talking about comparing things here with the cloud, then I have to consider the cost for power, I have to consider the cost for footprint, and I have to consider the cost for people. So all of those are in, and uh, that's one reason why you can see in my kind of second column here with Oracle Database uh, as a service, great big blue ball block. It's just the cost from the actual layers of the, the offering coming back from Oracle's cloud. And on my right-hand side is my power boxes, little thin layers, including people costs, back costs, power costs, LAN costs, SAN costs, all those are in there. They're just actually very, very small compared to the actual costs you end up paying for the overall software charges. Again, more detail available as required. This comes from a, a spreadsheet model that can expose a lot more detail if you want. But what I end up with is that the, the, if I did it bare metal, I could be, uh, with the, the left-hand bar here, I could be selective about the Oracle software I choose to deploy upon it. It still ends up being expensive. If I choose to take the service that includes Oracle Rack as a service back from Oracle, I've got to pay for all that different layer of software. Uh, what I have done here is apply a discount to the Oracle costs because it really looks quite remarkable if I, if I, and probably unbelievable if I put this in at list price. I have put a 60% discount across the lot. But even that said, it comes out vastly cheaper running on the power boxes because we need fewer processors, because our processors are faster, and because of that level of utilization. Again, I can look at Oracle, uh, I can maybe put in the Web3 application layer. Uh, not strictly true, I can't really run it on the Oracle uh, as a service piece, but it's just to be able to make the model uh, in included. I can do the PVU piece because I, I, I move forward from there, or I can run it on my power boxes, and then I can bring them all together. Now that I've shown you that it's cheaper, so again, I, my point of view is that it's considerably cheaper to run these kind of Oracle database, Oracle workloads, and other workloads such as DB2 and other pieces also come out the very similar way. Then, of course, once cost is balanced, we can look at liability. We can look at the fact that we're very, very reliable, particularly compared to, to the, uh, the Oracle x86 uh, environments. We have the, the benefits of security. So all these different pieces can then be added on top because actually we've saved money, and then we can actually deliver benefits in these other spaces too. So the point to, to wrap up uh, as, as we move towards the, the end of our session, the point, of course, is that you do need to consider how long are you staying in the first place. All my models there were showing staying there for three years. If you were going to come in and just run for a week or two, then, well, cloud is a perfectly valid alternative, as, of course, is elastic capacity on demand. So you could fire things up and change things quickly over a short duration if you want to do that. But how long you're staying should be considered. The Power 9 processors are much faster than the alternatives, and that means I can have fewer of them. Faster cores leads to lower software costs. I can use that virtualization over commitment, and it's one of the ways that the cloud providers make money, and you can keep that benefit using the on-premise versions should you want to do that with private clouds. And you need to be careful with how some of this software is licensed. It can be licensed by the thread, not the core, and the end, end result of that can be that the software costs can dwarf the hardware spend. So that's kind of it for, from my point of view. So I will continue to drive slides, uh, but at that, now that I've looked at different offerings in the cloud, Petra, would you like to come back in and just discuss the, the last few slides we hear we have about futures? Yes, and, and don't worry, this will just take a minute. Uh, so I guess I touched on, right, um, clients can connect their Oracle and DB, DB2 on AX databases to the Watson data platform to analyze data further. So there's a link, uh, there's a demo how you can do that as mentioned. Uh, we have clients concerned moving data to the cloud. So one thing, uh, if you could click once, David, um, is what we are looking at enabling cognitive capabilities for data residing on enterprise systems on-prem. Uh, because a lot of clients have data sitting there that they would like to leverage um, in order to do AI, right? Uh, I mean, a couple of things under investigation at the moment. If we move to the next slide, David, one thing we have done, we made the right packages available on the AX toolbox so that clients can get started with ML uh, machine learning on, on AX uh, packages such as Python and others. Um, you, uh, you'll find a link here um, at the bottom um, with uh, explaining how you could use these and get started. 
We have a couple of more things under investigation. One is to get actually inferencing capabilities onto the enterprise systems. Uh, we got good feedback from clients on that. At the moment, we are missing specific use cases. So what we really would like to understand, what would clients like to do on the enterprise system when it comes to inferencing? What would be the use cases? What would be the requirements in terms of latency and such? So if you're interested in something like that, it would be great if you could reach out to myself so, so that we can follow up on that. And of course, the standard questions I receive is, well, why don't we port Power AI on enterprise systems? What about TPUs on enterprise systems? So that's all things we are looking into, but it's all in an early state. So I don't know if David, you have anything to add to that, I guess. Otherwise we are done and have two minutes left for additional questions. <laughs> The only thing I would add to that at this point is that we are looking at uh, trying to create some, some demos, uh, maybe using the likes of sort of Node-RED to be able to link the Watson pieces uh, into the, the databases uh, coming in from, from AIX. We've already done uh, similar types of things with IBM I, so we're also looking to be able to see how we can do this with, with AIX, be that uh, potentially with the Node.js actually running in AIX uh, as, as a possibility, uh, we can explore that, but some demos are, are in the pipe and, and plan for the future as to how we might do that. Beyond that, as you say, uh, I'll hand to you, to Jyoti, there are reference links in our pack, but are there any other questions we have at the moment? Well, thank you so much, David and Petra, for covering um, a, a whole range of different uh, topics related to AIX. Um, there have been a few questions. Most of them, um, I think we have answered, but there's a couple at the end um, that I think Petra has just answered. Um, so let me uh, just, before we go on to questions, let me just tell people about the next couple of sessions that I'm trying to organize. Um, the next one is on the 24th of April, so save the date. Um, and that's going to be a demo of the IBM Cloud Private uh, and related topics. Uh, Stuart Cunliffe from our lab services team is going to be um, covering that. And then on the 15th of May, I have an IBM I and DB2 update, DB24i update um, coming on the 15th of May. Again, more details for, for these uh, sessions will be um, posted to the Wikilink and I'll inform you via email if you've subscribed to the um, PowerVug webinar series. Okay, um, so let me just stop the recording and then we'll continue to um, take questions. Thanks very much.